stop voting. Please, Joe Biden wants you to wait until after the Amy Coney Barrett nomination to the U.S. Supreme Court is dealt with, if you don't mind. Then, immediately after that action by the U.S. Senate, Mr. Biden will inform us as to his position on packing the court, the final arbiter of law in our society. So everyone just settle down, chill, just put everything on hold, please. And put down that absentee ballot, for heaven's sake. Tell the chauffeur, don't need the car. We're not going to the early voting site. At least not in the next few days. Maybe keep it running. We're waiting. We're waiting for Joe to tell us his position. And who would go vote for someone when they're telling you don't? Don't go vote. Wait. Not now. Don't vote yet. Well, that's a first. This is a election year with a number of firsts, and that's a rather odd statement. So what is going on here? Joe Biden has kind of owned up to the idea that he owes the public an explanation. So, of course, I maybe maybe took a few liberties because he's telling people, go vote, go vote. But he's also telling people that he will tell his position on court packing adding a bunch of new justices and naming them all and just taking over the court. If you have the majorities in Congress and have the White House, you could do that. He's going to tell us whether he will do that or not, but not until after this nomination battle is over. And it appears that the votes are there to confirm her. Uh, So I don't, you know, I don't know why the wait. I think the reason is it's because he doesn't want this issue to be up and and in front of people. And I think part of that is because so many Democrats have talked about court packing and all kinds of schemes like this that are, you know, they, they want to talk about Donald Trump destroying norms. Well, let's talk about a thermonuclear bomb on, on the norm of a nine member Supreme Court and on the norm of slow, regular change in the court. And and to me, it's a crime that the Supreme Court is not established in the Constitution. I don't know how that serves we the people, because the Democrats might want to tit for tat the Republicans. I mean, I I certainly recognize that uh, I urged Republicans back in 2016 to defeat Merrick Garland, not to, you know, never let him have a hearing, but to do, do your duty, bring him up, let, let's hear what he has to say. And then if he's an improvement to the court, then vote yes. If he's not an improvement, vote no. And I think the, the only uh, vote would have been no. Um, so, there, you know, there is some, I think, justification for Democrats being mad at Republicans or for the public being mad at Republicans. My goodness, I'm mad at Republicans and Democrats all the time. Uh, so there, there's no question there's justification to be mad But this tit for tat, it ignores the public. We don't have any interest in packing the court one way or the other. We have an interest in a court that's independent of both of these monsters. And and that gets lost. So, I mean, I would love Joe Biden. I mean, you'd, you'd have to kind of give him a second thought if he came out and said, look, I'm against court packing. I'm mad at the Republicans for fooling with this. I'm going to propose this constitutional amendment that would do what should be done, put the Supreme Court in the Constitution in a way that the Republican and Democratic thug, corrupt, bozo politicians in Washington can't play games with them. They can't change the number of the court. They can't do a lot of things. And, you know, I do a few other things while I was at it. I would say the number is going to be nine. I actually think that's a good number. Uh, I mean, it could be 13, it could be 17, it could be three. I think nine's a pretty good number, just between you and me. Um, But do it to where you have term limits. And the wonderful thing about term limits, now I love lifetime, as a term limits enthusiast, I like lifetime tenure 
for federal judges. I think it has actually created a federal court system in which there is some of that independence that the framers wanted and that anybody who who thinks about having a judiciary check their political process wants. Because there's no check at all. It's just politically changed willy nilly and whoever appointed them, they rule in that person's favor. We've been, I think, pretty lucky to have a court system. It's not perfect. I've lost a ton of times, including personally, criminally in a federal court. So trust me, this isn't, oh, I've had an easy time in federal court. They've always ruled my way. They have not. But when I look at the different you know, parts of the government, the executive branch, how many favors have they done me? How many times have they done the right thing? How are they, how are they fulfilling their role? It's pitiful. All the fears the founders had were absolutely justified. The Congress, oh, let's not even get started. It's pitiful. It's supposed to be the main branch of government, the one that's closest to the people. It's the most pitiful removed branch of government. We call them representatives. It's a dirty lie. They don't represent anybody. So the federal courts, you know, years ago, I did a column for town hall uh, where I said it's kind of like the the uh, what's his name Overman oh I'm Keith Overman I was so happy for a second that I'd forgotten his name but uh, Keith Overman used to have the worst uh, what is it worst worst and worstest or something worst worser and worstest awards and that's kind of maybe how you have to do it with the branches of the federal government but the courts have had some of that independence don't destroy it now, having, and I think it comes from lifetime tenure, when you get to the U.S. Supreme Court, it's too much power. And we've seen what they do. They want to put 17-year-olds on the court so that they can, you know, well, they've, increasingly they're in their 40s or, you know, uh, it's, and, and 40s is okay, I think. But I, we see kind of them trying to, to reach younger and younger. And and you have all this, these games about people dying and hanging onto the court forever. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg stayed on the court too long, frankly. I mean, I know you're not allowed to say anything bad about her, and it's not like it's a terrible crime. She had every right, and, and I'm sure she still felt, felt like she could do the job. But it's not a good thing to have people staying on the court until the day they die. And, and so I think you want people coming and going with some regularity, it would also mean that one president doesn't, because of you know somebody dying, doesn't get three or four picks on the Supreme Court, and then another president gets none. There'd be a more regular process. So I'm I'm all for reform, and in fact, I think the bankruptcy of our present politics is clear in that there's no proposals for reform. There's no real reform. There's a bunch of Democratic hotheads spouting off about we're going to pack the court or we're going to do this, we're going to do this to you and then we're going to do this to you and then we're, that's not, that's not our idea of reform. And, and Republicans out there who enjoyed that, you're doing the same thing, basically. I mean, if, the, the one thing that's almost absolutely certain is that if the shoe were on the other foot in any of these situations in Washington where there's bad behavior, the behavior would be equally bad on the other side. I mean, it's just, it's pitiful. That's why we, that's why we have constitutions so we, the people, can be in charge of what they're doing, and especially at the state level, where they actually have to get our votes to amend the constitutions. That makes a big difference. At the federal level, they could do it all with politicians at the state legislative level. The idea was that we would actually have representatives. The biggest problem we have in our society is the whole government is built on the idea of having people elected to represent us. And we have people elected. <laughs> it's just the represent us part that doesn't that doesn't exist. And it's a huge problem. So um, so so we don't spend three or four hours before we get to the first commentary of the week. The first commentary was about Biden's court packing scheme. And of course, the interesting thing about that title is that Biden has never really said he's for court packing. He kind of suggested he's not so much for court packing. And then all of a sudden he said he wasn't going to say, you know, some of this may be, oh, I don't want to upset the liberal wing of the Democratic Party by saying, hey, I'm not for some 
harebrained scheme that they have. Um, and maybe he figures uh, he doesn't really need people, you know, average people who kind of, I think, look at court packing and just think, this is not the change we're looking for. But what was most interesting is over, not this coming weekend, but last weekend, Biden basically said the voters don't deserve to know. He was asked the question. He didn't want to get into it. And so the reporter said, don't the voters deserve to know? And Biden, who's Mr. Nice Guy all the time, that's all you hear on TV uh, from the talking heads is what a nice guy he is. You hear other politicians. I know Washington people who, oh, he's a good man or whatever. I see video after video of him going off the hand. I mean, he threatened to, he wanted to fight some guy who disagreed with him uh, at the UAW in Michigan, what, months ago. Uh, there's the video of him lying about his, his uh, college record with some guy that it's not even the lying that's so offensive. It's like, why do you have this, this like nasty sense to you? He's a piece of work. Anyway, he, he said basically, no, they don't. The voters don't deserve to know. And I mean, that's how I think he actually feels. I don't, I can't look into his heart. Maybe it was just a big misstatement, but it was not corrected as a misstatement. It was corrected as a huge political blunder. Because, you know, a lot of times voters don't like to be slapped in the face right before they vote. They're used to being slapped in the face for two or four or six years after they vote. But usually right before it, there's no slapping, there's no kicking, there's no stealing from voters. They're, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, uh, it's like that, that little, uh, you know, kind of the, the eye of the hurricane right around the election for voters. We don't get abused as much. And by the end of the week, of course, Biden came out and said he would say he does think voters have a right to know just not now, just not now while he's encouraging you to go vote. They have a right to know after the whole process is over. And of course, there's no rational explanation for why we ought to wait to know what his opinion is until after it happens. I think he maybe he's hoping somehow she gets defeated and then he can say, oh, I was always against court packing and not have to kind of choose between the moderate people who don't like taking government and twisting it in some crazy ways and the radical left. Um, but, you know, this is uh, this is shaping up so much like 2016 and and uh, people who I think know politics uh, and look at the numbers and, you know, are serious about it have to realize Trump's map is very difficult. Um, they, he won three states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, that Republicans have not won for president for a long time. And especially Pennsylvania, I think had been quite some time. Michigan, too. Wisconsin, I think, was more recent. Um, I could be wrong. But for a long time. And that's a tough map. And it's hard, <clears throat> it's hard to see that map changing a whole lot. I mean, it's possible that he could pick up, you know, there's been some talk about Minnesota, uh, there's some backlash there, I think. And, uh, and it was close. I think it was two or three points last time with, with Hillary. Uh, Hillary, I think is a more negative figure than Biden. Um, only because people know her better. If you get to know Biden, he, he turns out to be a lot easier to dislike than you might have thought at first, first blush. Um, but anyway, I, I think that we're, we're, we're going to see, um, well, I've lost my train of thought completely. So, Well, this is a good point for us to uh, clarify something. Um, and that clarification is just as the voters really do seem to have a right to know something about what their politicians they're voting for are going to you know, want to do, our podcast listeners probably want to know what the heck we are doing. And this is This Week in Common Sense. You're Paul Jacob. They don't deserve to know, <laughs> Tim. Come on. Come on, man. <laughs> and you are talking about Monday's piece on thisiscommonsense.org, and it's Biden's court packing scheme, October 12, 2020. And uh, if on the video, we'll show a little picture of it. And so it's it'll, it'll be all, uh, 
understandable on the video, but on the audio, people should know that it is this is commonsense.org, where you've been writing since 1999, and we're dealing with, of course, this weird election, and Joe Biden, who is a very odd creature. He really is. He's, I and mean, we've talked about this before, that it's it's almost like with with the uh, criminal justice stuff and, and uh, race issues involved in that being so prominent, you could hardly pick someone, Democrat or Republican, who is as bad on those issues as Joe Biden has been throughout his career. I mean, it's just, it would be hard to pick somebody who would be worse than Joe Biden. But, but of course, none of that really gets raised. Uh, you know, I mean, this, and we're going to jump to Friday's script, which was Twitter's election interference. But in essence, this election has been, and it's not just the election, it's the whole four years of the Trump administration. It seems like we've been in constant election and election crisis type mode just it's it's fatiguing for the for the the spectator is fatigued by all of it and but but the biggest impact and and uh four years ago there was talk about how anti-trump the media was and larry sabato who's a a well-known political science guy and and uh at the university of virginia and he said look the media has always leaned democrat and by a good measure, you know, let's not let's not act like this is never happening before it happens all the time. And I thought that was very honest and and true uh, that it's not like, you know, this has never happened before, although it was markedly different. It was like double down, like like the amount of media bias squared. Um, and really, since then, it has only solidified and gone further. Um, there's a story in the New York Post. The story is that there's a laptop that has been found. Apparently, it's been given to the FBI, the contents. The contents were also then later because the person who had them, it's all reported by the New York Post, the person who had those, that a laptop who gave the hard drive to the FBI had made a copy. He hadn't heard anything. He... he contacted uh, Giuliani, which is, of course, I agree, makes makes the whole thing a little questionable right there. So then he, Giuliani gives the hard drive uh, contents to uh, the New York Post, and they print stuff about it. Now, Twitter blocks any people. They block the initial post by the New York Post. Uh, they had block other people trying to get to that post through Twitter. Facebook does the same thing. And their rationale, which they've now backed off of. So people who are going, well, they had every right to do it. I mean, Twitter's already, the, the CEO of Twitter has said, we didn't do very well here. I mean, he's pretty much admitted this was a mistake. The problem is, it was an intentional mistake in the <laughs> sense that, in the sense that this is what they've been doing all along. I mean, you can't like kick someone and then on day 57 of them being kicked, say, oh, that was just an accident. I didn't mean to kick you. Well, you've been kicking conservatives off the platform, deplatforming them, blocking access to them. It's, and you can say, well, we've done it to some liberals too. It's a little bit like the, the IRS uh, scandal, which of course for uh, about three fourths of the country doesn't exist because their media didn't tell them about the scandal but where the IRS blocked people from forming political organizations, the very essence of the First Amendment and of our country. And it was ignored. New York Times, Washington Post doesn't give a damn about it. Now, if you did anything about press freedom, they might care. But your First Amendment rights, your rights to you know any of the other amendments, they really don't care very much. Anyway, Twitter, Facebook, they they have every right, libertarians like me will say they have every right to run their business as they want, but not fraudulently. And one of the things that I point out about the fact that they've blocked this story, and they've blocked it because one of their arguments was, well, we don't print stuff about things that have been hacked. 
well, wait a second. <laughs> wait a second. About 99% of the news stories are things that are on background and oftentimes information that was hacked in the sense that the person who gave it to the media committed a felony by doing so. So let's not get silly. And, and don't think that I'm, oh, I'm mad at the media for printing stuff that's leaked. Thank God there's leakers. Thank goodness. I mean, is the, does the Washington Post want to renounce uh, the Pentagon Papers? Does the New York, is the New York Times ashamed that it printed the Pentagon Papers? And so this, this recoiling at, at these hacked emails or something. And of course, then you get to the bottom line. As you pointed out, I think you were the first person who, who I heard mention it. They weren't hacked. They weren't hacked. The, you know, if this is Hunter Biden's laptop, um, and they haven't denied, they haven't said it's not. Um, if it is, it wasn't hacked. It was like handed to someone and left. And so uh, there's no, there's not the John Podesta, you know, oh, his emails were hacked. And look, I'm sorry for anyone who gets their stuff hacked. I don't want to have my stuff hacked. But I have to say that if someone hacks something, especially of someone who is in a position of power, and Mr. Podesta was in a position of power, and we find out really critical information that's somewhat damning about this issue or that issue, I'm glad we found out about it. So, I mean, there is a little rub there. I, I, I still feel sorry for him, but I'm glad I, I'm glad I know some things. And uh, so anyway, this effort by Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. I mean, YouTube said if, if somehow if the World Health Organization doesn't approve it, you can't say it on their platform. I mean, it's ridiculous. But there's been all this talk about the one section. I, I'm going to forget what it is. Maybe it's 230 uh, that Trump says he's going to repeal and so on. The reality is, and there are cases in court, this is fraud. They invited all of us in with certain expectations, certain things that are written into the deal. And I mean, you can't advertise one thing, get people to invest, even if they're not investing their money, they're investing their time under certain, if you say, come to my house every day and you can build a wall, um, <laughs> maybe I should, <laughs> not a wall, not a wall. And, and then we can disagree about how much of the wall is really being built. But, but anyway, build anything. And you start doing it and investing your time in that. And then all of a sudden I change the deal. You could go to a court and say, hey, wait a second. I'm invested here and I've been I've been defrauded. My time, my effort has been defrauded. And that's exactly what Twitter and Facebook and YouTube have done. Um, now, whether the, whether you can win a case or not, I don't know. But there's so much, especially from people who are like me, libertarians, about all their rights. And I'm not, I, they have every right that any other company has. They ought to. They have every right that I have. But it doesn't mean we have to like it. It doesn't mean we have to be careful not to say censorship because in essence, they are creating a world of censorship. And maybe that's not the right word. What do we want to say? They're creating a world in which you don't get to know stuff, in which information is blocked from you. And no, that isn't a crime but it ain't good. And I'm just, I'm just yelling in the wilderness to people, other people. And I think we all recognize this is not good. It, it, the truth is you don't have to be on the right. You got to recognize anytime. It's like people are scared that Trump has too much power. Well, don't you think Obama had too much power and Bush had too much power before him? You're right. Trump has too much power, but the next guy, no matter how nice he seems or she seems, they're going to have too much power unless we do something about it. So I'm uh, I, I said at the end of this script uh, on Friday, uh, I suggested that maybe there's another element to go after. Uh, and you egged me on, Tim. There's no question about that. Uh, but there's another way to go after him. If Twitter is actively promoting some candidates over other candidates, aren't they violating campaign finance law, McCain-Feingold, which much of it is still in effect, of course, and other campaign, you know, the whole pile that's been piled on, all the rules and regulations, isn't the whole idea 
that powerful people don't get to spend all kinds of money promoting things, at least without there being some report. I know that if I was having that impact spending money like Twitter is or Facebook or or YouTube, and I'd have to report. My organizations have to face all these rules and regulations and pay attorneys and others to, you know, to figure out how we do it. And yet here are these very powerful organizations having a huge impact and having a partisan impact. And nothing is said years ago. I wrote a column at Town Hall. Do you, you might remember this, um, Tim. They, it was, a, it was uh, something about the boss, but Bruce Springsteen, who I kind of like, n- not politically, but music-wise, did a concert for John Kerry. And there were some complaints about the fact that, in essence, you know, while you and I can't write a check for more than, well, we couldn't, we couldn't write the check anyway, but, but we're not allowed, if we were wealthier, we're not allowed to write more than, what is it, 2,400 or 2,600 uh, primary and general election. And, and so if I, you know, if my brother or my best friend ever, who I think is the most wonderful person in the world is running for office, and I'm willing to like suffer through my retirement to give him a big check for $5,000 or $10,000, I can't do it. I can't do it because I'd be corrupting my friend. That'd be a corrupting, horrible, terrible thing if I believed in someone so much to, to, to really make a sacrifice and give that person $5,000. Um, but at the same time, Bruce Springsteen can do a concert and give it to John Kerry worth $250,000 or a million dollars And nobody says boo. And that is our campaign finance system. And and you can disagree with me, but and and feel free to to go to YouTube or you know or or this is commonsense.org and and we then post it on YouTube and argue otherwise. But I'd really prefer you only argue otherwise if you've actually ever filled out a campaign finance report. If you've ever had a campaign finance complaint filed against you, because in most states, someone with no, uh, they don't risk anything can file a complaint and you're going to go through a whole legal process that's going to cost you money unless you want to go deal with a bunch of uh, sharks at the campaign finance bureau uh, without an attorney. And I suggest that you pay the money for the attorney. But that's that's the way our campaign finance system works. And for small fries like me, you're constantly afraid that your contribution is going to cost you 10 times that much in fighting the whole legal morass that controls campaign spending. If you're a big shot, your attorney calls you and says, yeah, you need to write a check for whatever. And you write out the check and you give it to him just like you write out the check for the rent. Or for the, you know, for food or for any other cost of doing business. But trust me, us small fries, we ain't got that kind of money for that sort of cost of doing business. And uh, and so we now have a system and, and all kinds of good people who want the right things are urging it to get worse. But we have a system custom made for billionaires to have the most possible influence and for the little guy to have almost none and all the people screaming that we have to we have to red tape down the billionaire in order for them to not have so much power trust me in the end i'm going to have that red tape all over me you're going to have it all over you and the billionaires are going to have a team of lawyers and accountants probably not only getting through the red tape, but then encouraging the legislators to do some more because it stops folks like us, like every other regulation under the sun has been shown to do. What did the regulations do? They block access to the new guy, to the startup, to the small fry, and they protect the big interest. So much so that we talk about regulatory capture. And of course, the big interests constantly capture the regulatory agencies that are supposed to control them. The same thing happens in politics. 
I see it every day and it gets worse the more we're looking for the government to police speech. And when people run for office and spend money doing an ad or, you know, sending you something in the mail, that's speech. You may like it, you may not like it, it's speech. And if we're going to have the government regulate it, we are going to get less of it and we're going to get more of it from the very sources. And we see it already. Every campaign finance, is this just getting worse so fast that we can't keep up? Or in essence, is the solution making the disease worse every time a new solution is laid on top of the disastrous old solution? Yeah, you know, um, the thing that I like to uh, talk to my progressive friends and annoy them with is this idea of regulatory capture. And the very the whole idea of progressive era legislation as what the plutocracy came up with to control everybody more. People forget, for instance, that Morgan banks were largely behind the Federal Reserve, that it was not the small guy, it wasn't the little guy, it wasn't the, you know, the, your, your, your local cab driver who has all these pet theories about how things should work. It was very, very rich people and very, very well-paid uh, lawyers <laughs> who yeah. cooked up much of our regulatory uh, regime. And the, the whole design is to make it hard for competitors. And that's in business as well as in politics. And yes. th this is an important lesson that economists actually have been teaching. Good economists have been teaching for 100 years. But it's very hard to get normal people to quite grok that, and I wish people would actually pay a little more attention. I'm not sure how we're going to get the message out better, but we need to. Part of, it, part of it, I think, is there's this sense that the government's always trying to do the right thing. Sometimes, sometimes they aren't quite able to. It's so tough to police everything and do everything, but they're always trying to do the right thing. And there are times where I think graft is not like a side product, uh, a waste product of the political process. It's like the main thing, the level of, and, and this isn't, this isn't, oh, modern times are so terrible. I think the founders would have told you how corrupt politics are. This is age old and it's hard to get away from. It's like when I was doing high school debate, you always had to, you know, you had to come up with some plan. It was usually some plan to dramatically upscale government to control everything and make the world perfect, uh, which I always found a little irritating, but I like to go <laughs> negative. And, um, and, but, but there was always this kind of sense that, well, you have to fund your plan. What are you going to do? And, you know, you would always, there would be some evidence card you'd get these little books and you cut them up and you'd paste the evidence the little quote from some expert onto the card and then you'd organize them i i wouldn't whenever we would get into the final round we would always be going to our other the other debaters at our school going could we borrow your could we borrow your card file and one guy he had the greatest evidence file and he would always kind of give me that look and and you know later you just have to go i love you I love you so much for doing the work that I just didn't do. But anyway, uh, Steve, we sure appreciate. We still think about you and how darn good you were at brilliant guy. Anyway, but. And apparently well organized. Very well organized, which I don't know if anyone's gotten the hint, but is not my strong suit. Uh, anyway, I married into organization. I figure that's the, that, that, that gets me ahead and it has, trust me. Um, but anyway, before I lose my train of thought, whatever I was once talking about, we would have evidence cards that would say things like, um, you could get $30 billion by cutting waste and fraud or 30 zillion or trillion or whatever. And, you know, you could say that and then people would argue about it. Well, but you can't do that. But yes, you can. And. And I always thought it's so silly because everyone knows you can't. Everyone know. Everyone says they're going to cut fraud. It's never cut. There's no savings there. It's silly. It's ridiculous. It's kid stuff. I mean, it's only because we're in this debate game that anybody would say ridiculous crap like that and, and kind of believe it. And then I grow up and I realize that's how Congress works. They do the same thing. They're constantly like, look at the 
Um, and I'm not sure how this relates to anything, Tim, so I'm just going to go on the rant and not worry about it. But but look how, you know, it, it with medical stuff, anytime they're doing a medical thing, they will get savings so that their bill doesn't look like it spends too much money by cutting the reimbursements to doctors from Medicare. So we're just going to cut those and we're going to save $400 billion dollars over the a trillion dollars over the next 10 years. So that's great. So CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, scores the bill and they say, OK, yeah, this bill is only going to cost uh, 200 billion because it cost 1.4 trillion. But we're going to say 1.2 trillion is made up in, in no longer paying doctors so much when they deliver services for Medicare. So that happens. The bill passes. Everybody argues as well. It's only going to cost 200 billion. Everybody knows that it really costs 1.4 trillion, not 200 billion, because six months after that bill passes, there's going to be a crisis in Medicare because doctors are going to go, no, I no longer see Medicare patients because I, I can't afford to lose my house and live in, you know, in the alley or underneath the interstate. Because I can't make a profit if you don't pay me more than like four cents for Medicare reimbursement. And so what happens? Congress passes a fix. They have done this literally countless times. They pass a fix. And so the bill always costs $1.4 trillion. And look, these people, they may be, they may be obnoxious. They may be completely stupid about any technology. If you ever watched a hearing where they're talking about any technology, but hey, look. I'm older. I, I have sympathy for people who are stupid about technology. Not that I know any of them personally, moi, uh, but, 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 you know, they aren't completely stupid. They have to know the 15th time that they've done this, that it's likely to just really be a trick to lie to the American people about how much this is going to cost. And what do you think about people who tell you, hey, I'll, yeah, I'll get that for you. It'll only cost $2. And then when they show up, say, oh, yeah, it really cost $14. You kind of, you know, you don't, you don't have people like that do too many economic transactions for you. That's for sure. That's what Congress does constantly. And um, anyway, uh, I'm not sure what that related to, but, uh, but it's true. It's all true. Tuesday's piece, Sue the Governor's, there's an element of that going on here, too, because we're talking about lawsuits. I was involved in some lawsuits and uh, during this pandemic, and the courts did not function as quickly. And sometimes they function awfully slowly, even when there's not a pandemic. But it's, you know, so many governors, it seems like, and the expectation from media reports was the president could act the same way, can pretty much do anything. If there's an emergency, um, and I have to admit, I, I haven't looked at all these emergency laws, I, and I've read very little about the legal aspects behind all of this. We haven't had that many pandemics, thank, thank goodness. But the, it seems like the expectation is the governor can do anything. He can say, oh, no, your business is shut down forever. Your business can open. Your, you know, it's, it's, and, and how they get any of that power, and of course, they have the power to shut down churches, you know, there is a First Amendment. And at a certain point, are they suggesting without amending the Constitution that they can pass a statute that gives them to pow the power to suspend the Constitution whenever they want? I mean, that would kind of mean that we really don't have constitutional restraints. You can't do that. There's no state. Certainly can't. Do, that's not the way the, the law works. Constitutional amendments trump. And if they want to pass a constitutional amendment suggesting that in an emergency they can do anything they want, then then propose it. Let's see if the states ratify it. I'm kind of thinking they won't. Um, but that is the way that they viewed it. And luckily, there have been some court cases that, uh, you know, that have that have worked out. On our side, there's also been court cases that have, have not worked out. And, and by our side, I mean that people actually have the freedom that they've been promised 
that the contract that we call the U.S. Constitution is still in, in force and that no governor has the right to take away your First Amendment or your Second Amendment or your Third Amendment or Fourth Amendment or Fifth or Sixth or any constitutional right that you have because there's a pandemic. Now, some people might say, oh, well, Paul, what you're saying is that anybody can go anywhere and do anything they want and spread any disease and we're all going to die. Thanks a lot. But that's not what I'm saying. Nobody has the right to come on your property and spread any disease you don't want them to spread. And I suspect you don't want them to spread any. Nobody has any right to go into any business without wearing a mask if the owner of that business says you're wearing a mask. And the truth is, there's probably a pretty solid legal argument. I could quibble on it, but there's probably a pretty solid legal argument, at least certainly under the current you know, legal uh, regime and precedents and so on, that government does have a right to regulate commerce in such a way that they could make businesses require masks or whatever uh, you know, thing that they do that's going to stop some terrible disease. Now, I, that's, that's not the way I'd like it to be, but I think that that goes to court. The court's likely to say you could do it. Even then, you'd have to, I think, in this world of kind of limited constitutional rights, you'd have to, as the government show, that you have some rational basis for doing that. And I, you may get a, a jury or a judge to say you do today. I think the further we go in this, uh, most of the people I know who I respect their scientific knowledge, their medical knowledge, uh, tend to, the, the overwhelming majority of them tend to believe that all of the mask wearing, all of the hand washing, all of the everything else uh, to stop the spread of the virus has been pretty much worthless, pretty much has had no effect uh, and will have no effect. Um, now, obviously, if if everybody sequestered, you know, for the next 50 years or something, maybe maybe it would slow down the spread and stuff. But but of course, then we get, as we've talked about many times, that there are other harms. I mean, there are people uh, dying of suicide today who probably would not be suicidal if they hadn't had lockdowns and stuff. There are other people, and that, that's you know one aspect of it. There are all kinds of people who haven't had medical procedures that, you know, had they had, they might have lived, who haven't had cancer diagnoses because they haven't gone to the doctor, even though they feel bad because of the whole COVID thing and the lockdowns and the and a lot of fear mongering. And look, uh, it's not it's not hard for people to be afraid uh, when you've got you know two hundred thousand people died of something new. Um, but the, it seems to me, and, and we've discussed this many times, Tim, that the, the fear here seems to be hyped and it seems to be hyped with a political angle in mind. And I just, I'll just say, I don't have any evidence of secret meetings on the edge of town in some warehouse between the, you know, the, the old TV networks or the New York times or anybody else. Maybe CNN is actually meeting right now in that warehouse. But uh, but I think there has been a, a glee in hyping this, in making this a disaster. And I think it has been largely aimed at hurting Donald Trump. And I think the problem is it's a little bit like the court packing. You may be aiming your weapon at somebody who deserves some sort of something. But it seems like again and again, it's the American people who are being hit at, at just point blank range. And when you, we talked about it with the masks early on, that it was a huge mistake to lie about there being no use to the mask. Remember early on, we had listened to all kinds of condescending talking heads on television, tell us how, oh, it would be disastrous. We don't know how to use a mask. It's counterproductive. We'll be more apt to get the disease, blah, 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 blah. So much so that even little old me, who doesn't consider himself any great medical expert, started to think, this is BS. And, and of course, turned out it was. It was. They lied to us. 
And they lied to us because they were afraid we'd gobble up the N95 masks, which I don't think we would have if they would have just said, look, those are reserves. We've got a crisis here. They, throughout this whole thing, to me, the most upsetting thing has been the American people are never trusted to step forward and do the right thing, even though in every crisis I can think of, huge numbers of Americans step forward and do the right thing, not even being asked they step forward and do the right thing. And yet they're never, never trusted. They're always viewed as, as kind of pesky kids who we can't really trust. And the only people who view everyone as pesky kids are the type of crooks on Scooby-Doo. And, and so it's like, why do they treat us like that? I think that's why, because they're crooked. They want, and, and crooked maybe, they're not on the take, maybe they just love power so much, but that's kind of an intellectual corruption that ain't healthy for them or for us. What I'm saying is, why do they treat us that way? Why does someone always think that someone's out to get them? I tend to think that people like that is because they are out to get people. I think the politicians don't trust the public because they know that if the public knew what they were doing and thinking and planning, the public would be livid. And so, of course, when there's a crisis, there's no level of trust. And I have heard people suggest that that's somehow the fault of the American people. And I can't think of anything more false than that. The American people, we ain't perfect, but by golly, we deserve better. And throughout this entire thing, we would have had a greater cohesion. And the truth is, you know, as a libertarian who's always for tiny, tiny government, no, could you make it smaller? Could it do less? And who tends to look at all this kind of groupthink as foreign? You know, it's not, you know, patriotism. Oh, we're all Americans. And so you always kind of, we're always kind of wanting to kick the tires and go, are you really just trying to suck us into something on some false patriotic BS? We're very skeptical. And yet several years ago, even before Trump, I began to be worried about how little legitimate authority anyone in government had because there are times during a fire or a flood or a pandemic or a war where you might need government to say something or request something or even order something depending on what the absolute crisis of the moment is and you would want there to be some level of of social cohesion there's some level of trust between people and you have it. We have it all the time. It, it flows naturally. I mean, in my daily life, I constantly am dealing with people and there's trust back and forth. This isn't foreign to us. It's we, we deal with it all the time everywhere, except between the people who are supposed to represent us and us. And that just is bizarre. And so, um, you know, we go to court to try to get our, our rights back. And I think that... Uh, I think we'll succeed in many cases after the fact, after our rights have been taken away. And the one thing that would be nice, in the same way that we talk about Biden and the court packing and some of these different things, where is somebody with a solution? Let's say whatever happens now, let's, let's make tomorrow better. The same thing's true here. If this pandemic ends, and which hopefully someday it will, and we don't do anything to look at what the rules were for our government, what sort of parameters we want in emergencies so that they don't take a bunch of power. Even if we decide afterwards, hey, uh, they really didn't do that constitutionally. I want some real block that stops them next time. It's not enough after the fact to have some court say, oh, well, you were really right. I want to stop government from taking those rights away in the first place. And so we need to look at the whole system in every state. What power does the governor really have? And during the crisis is not usually the best time to do that. But we have to do that. Now, um, we were talking about Sue the Governor's the Tuesday piece. Uh, but you've also sort of touched on the issues that were dealt with on Thursday's piece. 
for who the bell toll. No, excuse me, for who the toll. For That's who right. the toll, which is about it's difficult because you want to say who the bell tolls for or whatever. Which was John Donne. Remember, remember the great poem by John Donne. Ask well, not for whom the bell that. tolls; it tolls for thee. I never think of it that. I always think of it as uh, Ernest Hemingway. Right, poem. right, right, right. Because he referenced that great poem. Um, anyway, uh, but this is for who the toll, and this is about the World Health Organization, and they're they're pulling back from the whole lockdown thing, which I thought was an interesting motion because the Who's been sort of the crazy man of the official government outfits. I mean, they've been in hock for the Chinese and and they've been this way and that way and they, they haven't been very reliable and yet they've been relied upon by social media to determine whether something is, you know, worthy of um, sharing online, which I think is kind of odd. Well, it's as if they have, like, the social media has complete trust in them even though I think if you ask regular people, they have almost zero trust in who the World Health Organization. I mean, I think we have and should have some limited trust in the CDC, but I have a lot more confidence in the CDC because there's some level of accountability than with who. I mean, any UN organization, accountability in the UN, they just they just don't mix. Uh, so. But it, it is interesting for them to come out and kind of reiterate what we've talked about so much, which is the whole idea of the lockdown was for two weeks or three weeks. It was to, to buy time to be able to prepare. And then the lockdown became, I think, something to stop anyone from ever dying, because I don't know if you know this, Tim, but no one ever deserves to die. No one ever deserves to die. Now, I know some people out there, they think people deserve to die. Not me. No one ever. And we can live that way until it all comes crumbling down because we've decided we're not going to produce anything anymore. We're going to hide in our little hovels. And we think that somehow some magic in Washington, they're going to drop ship money into our account. And we'll just, you know, nobody's going to go outside, but somehow, you know, Uber Eats will show up at the right time and have a really nice meal. This is crazy. And I don't want anybody to die. And I don't want anyone to be forced to do anything they don't want to do. If you think you're going to get COVID and die and you want to stay home and not go outside, then stay home and don't go outside. If you want, you know, Nursing homes, I would want, uh, you know, my mom's living with my sister, thank goodness, and is not in a nursing home. Uh, but if she were, I would want them to be awfully careful. And, you know, there's all kinds of things we can do. Let people freely decide what they're going to do and not do and don't have. I mean, we, we've kind of accepted the Chinese model. We saw China with their lockdowns welding people into their homes so they couldn't leave with shutting up the first person who said anything about it and literally you know threatening him and and imprisoning him for a short period of time and demanding that he recant and we saw that and then we saw right next door taiwan where a free society actually convinced their citizens to help them do the sort of tracing and and of course, they had some experience with SARS. It wasn't their first rodeo, and that made a big difference. But they showed the sort of ingenuity and cohesion that a free society ought to have. And I think we lack some of that cohesion. And of course, I, every time I say that word, I think about that's what the people who like some sort of forced national service a military draft combined with let's draft people, young people, <laughs> never, never your age group, always the young people, uh, you know, who may not be strong enough to uh, give campaign contributions to fight it. Um, but we have to somehow imprison them all together so that they will have social cohesion. I'm not talking about that sort of mandated social cohesion. I'm talking about people who can speak to each other who have respect for each other, a society in which you don't distrust everyone who has a differing opinion. And how do you get a society where you don't distrust everyone? 
and don't fear everyone who has a different opinion. I think you find a society in which people who have a different opinion have very little power to force you to live their way. That's the solution. And that's the way to social cohesion. But, uh, but anyway, that's, um, I, I think, uh, it, it, when I saw this story, uh, you know, the who I think has been so bad, but, um, even a stop clock is, is twice, twice a day. Correct. It's interesting that even the who gets it, but in the U S I think we, we still have so much push for forever lockdowns. And again, I think that's because everyone sees it as society is completely open and I'm forced to like go get the disease in the next few seconds or society is completely shut down and see with freedom, people get to do what they want. And people who have real fears for, for great reasons can take the kind of actions they need to take without destroying all of, of you know, uh, productive society. And, and that may seem like, oh, you just want people to make money. If people don't make any money, if people don't make any products, we're in deep trouble. And you know what? The richest people in the West are in the least trouble. The poorest people in the rest of the world are in the most trouble. And people who want to do their macho about, oh, they hate, they're going to eat the rich and so on. They're foolish. They're fools. And they'll get people killed. We've got to produce stuff. That's how mankind thrives. That's how mankind creates abundance that can help people who aren't in a position, usually because some thug political crap in their own country, but people who are starving do not want the United States economy, you know, pushed to its knees because that is not going to help the third world. It's going to kill millions of people in the third world. Well, this regional difference thing is especially interesting to me because this distinction between, you know, third world poverty and not having as much leeway and the store to source of wealth and so forth, they're being at greater risk for the lockdowns than we in the West are. And of course, richer in the West are better off than poor in the West. I mean, it's the people who are hurt most on these things are the poor. Um, but this is, is largely a regional thing. And I think we should all understand that, but it's also relevant in a way that we've not talked about very much. And it's that, by the logic of the initial logic of the lockdowns, you know, to flatten the curve, to to save the um, hospitals, basically, this only made sense regionally because, you know, it was only, you know, though Seattle had a few problems right away, really only in New York was it a problem right away. I mean, that's where that's where the real damage was. And they did have a strain on their system for a short time. And lots of resources were put their way that they never used, by the way. You know, whole right. ships went to the harbor and were never used or were barely used at all. Uh, around the country, many out, you've written about this, uh, around the country there have been uh, the, the the Army Corps of Engineers or the U.S. Army or some out, a number yes. of outfits put up, uh, you know, MASH units, basically. Hundreds of beds, new beds that... They that were never used. Them. They were actually dismantled before they were yeah. never used. Um, and that's the case at this state which never had a peak, according to the, the – there's it's actually a regional thing. The virus itself infected the country and the world in regional ways that most people don't quite understand. New York City was uh, horribly hit. We've had – in my county, we've had only five or six people get right. it and no one died. Well, and, and New Orleans was hit very hard right off the bat. Well, they just had Mardi Gras. And, of course, why would why would New York get hit hard? Well, you've got so, so many people from all over the world coming right. through New York. So, so you know, it's not surprising the way it spread so much because it spread mainly to the hubs of where, where you're going to get people coming in and out. And I, I wish there was more reporting. I know we live in a world in which – there isn't much news reporting and it's all completely slanted. So if the narrative, if it doesn't fit their narrative, you're never going to hear about it. But Trump has said numerous times that China shut down its own, you know, economy kind of its travel within the country, but allowed Chinese folks to travel all over the world. And 
I've never seen anything written as any sort of follow up to how accurate is that? What are the numbers? Is there any evidence that there was some foresight in this? Did they just forget to say, hey, you can't travel anywhere. And by the way, that means across the globe, too. I really would like to know because I'd like to get a sense for, you know, whether whether China in essence didn't care or or cared and wanted us to suffer or really was innocent. And it just happened to be that they didn't think to do that. They knew people were going to be leaving and they thought, oh, that will be wonderful if they leave because we've got coronavirus here. I don't know. I have to say that any time the Chinazis, as I like to call them, as the folks in Hong Kong call them, um, anytime I'm trying to think of what their thought process is, I'm not very generous because they do believe it's okay to, you know, commit genocide and so on. And those people, you know, I don't, I haven't softened any on the Nazis in the last century, and I'm not softening any on the Chi Nazis in this century. So, uh, which leads us, actually, uh, we should finish this thought, but leads us to our final, uh, which is the NBA's China syndrome. But uh, it, so anyway, I'm, now I've lost my train of thought, so I can't remember what I was going to go back to to mention to then go forward. But. I don't know if there's a big regional element to the Wednesday piece, the NBA's China syndrome, but I'm sure you know it better than I do. Well, there's no regional. Uh, it's it's. Uh, I think it's the whole world that needs to be concerned. But um, of course, we're talking about uh, Asia, and particularly the Orient and China, and that is economically, I think, the most important area in the world today. And we have we have spent decades since Tiananmen Square since it was made clear to the world that the people in China really would like to have some freedom and democracy, because they know the democracy will allow them some chance to keep some of the freedom. And we learned that the Chinese Communist Party, which I know they're, they're kind of state fascist, totalitarian capitalists these days, whatever it is, but that's why it's probably just as well to call them Nazis. Because that's that's how it all ends up, is that they're going to smash anyone's head in who doesn't do what they say. And whether whether you wear red or black or whatever your little symbol is, whether it's a swastika or a hammer and sickle, if you smash people's heads in and kill them and kill their entire people, if they don't do exactly what you say, then that's not what I want. And that's what we have today in China. And they're dangerous because unlike the Soviet Union, which was kind of too poor and hapless to be as big a threat as they could have been, China's not poor and hapless. They they have a, a sturdy, hardworking working class. They've got technology. They've got money. And they have had, I think, a United States that is, I started to say, asleep at the switch for what, three or four decades. But that's a lie. I don't think they've been asleep at all. I think we have had a United States government that has said, we're not that scared about totalitarianism. We're not that wed to the idea of free speech that the Chinazis hate so desperately. So that doesn't bother us much. And there's a ton of money that our well-connected friends can make in China. And, and don't get me wrong, anyone who went over to China and made money, the fact that you made money is my favorite part of that. Just trust me. I like people making money. I might be able to ask you to make a contribution. Heck, if you don't have any, what can I do? So I love people making money. I have nothing against China making money. And trust me, I think a free China is going to kick a lot of economic butt around the world. So this is not a America's got to be the superpower. It's not a nationalistic thing. We're dealing with Nazis. And in America, we like to spout off that we get to go punch a Nazi whenever we want. Well, you're pretending. These are real Nazis. These are real Nazis. 
who will kill millions of people if that's what it takes, and they will kill you. And we can pretend that's not true. We can be Mark Cuban, and that's what my thing was about. Mark Cuban, who is the owner of the uh, Dallas Mavericks, the NBA team. And, of course, the NBA, we, we did a bunch of commentaries in 2019 when basically uh, a guy, uh, Moray, I think was his last name, uh, with the uh, Houston Rockets made the comment, stand with Hong Kong, fight for freedom. I thought that was a good comment. But there was hell to pay. There was all this China canceled a bunch of things with the NBA. China's paying like you know, uh, billions of dollars every year. Uh, and the Chinese people love basketball. And so the NBA has a lot of profits they can make there. Now, I'd like to think that the Chinese people's love of basketball, so easy to relate to, you know, I mean, we all love it. You might not love basketball. You might love something else. But, oh, this, it's neat. And I like that they love basketball. And I wish that their love of basketball could be used against the Nazis who run their country. Because if we had an NBA, and I'm, I'm not expecting this, unfortunately, but if we had an NBA that believed where owners said, look, I'm not going to go along with totalitarians, even if I could make more money by being in bed with totalitarians, I'm not going to do it. All of a sudden, the Chinese people might realize, you know what? Our Nazi leaders can't give us what we want because the rest of the world doesn't go along with totalitarians. Instead, they're pretty much told, we can get whatever we want. Our leaders will get it for us. That's not good. And what, what happened is Cuban made some comment about I'm against human right violations around the world. Megyn Kelly was aiming to get him to say something about China. And she said, including the ones in China? And, of course, he made the point China is not the only country with human rights violations, which is a dodge. Because, you know, if someone said, hey, did you commit that crime? And you say, well, I'm not the only person who committed a crime. That's kind of like saying, yeah, you China has committed those violations, but I'm not going to I'm not going to speak up about it. I'm going to try to hide it with all the other things going on in the world. And um, she pointed out that, you know. They're making about 500 million. That's half a billion dollars in China. And they want to do it. And, and Cuban at the end basically said, um, so you don't want us to do any business with China? Well, they're customers of ours. And I'm OK with doing this is that quote. I'm OK with doing business with China. And so we have to pick our battles. I wish we could solve all the world's problems, but we can't. I wish we could solve all the world's problems. Well, we all do. But you can really only solve the ones that are right in front of you. And this one is right in front of him. It's right in front of all the NBA teams. It's right in front of LeBron James. It's right in front of anyone else who's doing business in China to decide how you're going to do this, do it, whether you're going to do it. And... We have to pick our battles. And what he means by that is it sounds so much like what LeBron James said. In the end, LeBron James, when he mouthed off about, oh, they they need to watch what they're saying. They're ignorant or something. In the end, he pretty much admitted it was he who was ignorant about anything that was going on there. And all he meant to say was that saying stuff has consequences. And yes, it does. Because if you're doing business with Nazis, they are going to be upset if you call them on it. And what LeBron James really was saying is, I want to do business with Nazis. It's very lucrative. Go peddle your help everybody stuff somewhere else. And that's exactly what Mark Cuban was saying. I want to make money. I don't really care that much that they're Nazis. And, and there's an argument to be made that, oh, we need to trade with Nazis or commies or totalitarians, whatever phrase you want. You know, the people who smash people in the face if they say something they don't like. That's the people we're talking about. That, that maybe things are going to help if we trade with them and, and so on. And I generally favor that view. The problem is we've been doing that at least according to the method 
our leaders have been pursuing for so long. And of course, Trump comes up and, and nothing's gotten better. It's only gotten a lot worse. China's gained a lot of power and and they're very dangerous. And they're, I mean, if Google China uh, war conflict with, and you'll find <laughs> Taiwan, Hong Kong, Tibet. You know, I know it, everyone always says, you know, China doesn't aggress against their neighbors. Well, they don't have to. They've already taken them over and have them in concentration camps and stuff. I can't hear you, Tim. Try again. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Oh. Uh, well, they have kind of been at war with India. I mean, they, there's been skirmishes in India, yes. right? Northern yes. India. No, that's my whole point, that the, that the, the kind of the... I read a story on CNN the other day that talked about what was happening in this year in China with the U.S. relationship and the and whether they're more afraid of Biden or Trump or whatever. And it was just it was silly. The whole article, they never mentioned the two words Hong Kong. The CNN made it out as I mean, how do you how do you deal with the U.S. Chinese relationship over the last year and never mention the word Hong Kong? The words. I mean, that's insane. Um, and, and the whole thrust of it, what, well, there were two thrusts. One was that this was really all Trump's fault. Xi Jinping is a leader like any other leader, China, you know, Chinese Communist Party, it's a slightly different government, but let's not get all upset. Uh, it's really Trump who's made everything hard to, to deal with. And then they also suggested that the Chinese are not sure who would be tougher with them, Biden or Trump. And I mean, I just think that's hard for anyone. I mean, you can you can say Trump's tougher because he's a lunatic, crazy person who likes to say you're fired and is just obnoxious to deal with. OK, but he's tougher than Biden when it comes to China. I mean, I can't imagine anyone who you would think would be weaker uh, dealing with China from one, you know, the, the deals. And and that's the I think that's the other thing that we that we didn't talk about when we talked about Twitter and Facebook and everything else is the underlying story about Biden. And I just want to take a second uh, to do it because the, the idea is, Hey, there's no real evidence that there was a quid pro quo that Biden got rid of that prosecutor because he was coming after Hunter or that or Burisma or, that's not necessarily true, or maybe it is, or it's not. And we can argue, and, and it's even like this has been debunked, you hear from time to time. Well, nothing's been debunked. I mean, you can't, <laughs> someone, can, someone can make a charge, and you can say you don't have any evidence for that. But that doesn't debunk the charge. To debunk it, you'd have to show it was false. And nobody's bothered to even look into it. But here's the bottom line to me. I don't know what else you want to look into. I don't know what laws may have been broken. But I have just this sizzling sensation that Hunter Biden had only one attribute that caused Chinese state influence, state connected banks to give one point five billion dollars. Only one attribute that caused that crazy former wife of the Russian mayor of Moscow or whatever to wire him $3.5 million for Burisma to to hire him and pay him, what was it, $80,000 a month. It's an oil company. He has no experience in oil. The only attribute I can think of that he has that would have elicited those millions and billions is his dad was vice president of the United States. And do you notice that his his job with Burisma didn't come before his dad was the point man for Ukrainian policy? It happened afterwards. And what would we say today if Trump, let's say Trump, uh, he ends up, he resigns, he's going to be secretary of state instead of president. Pence takes over. Trump flies to Ukraine where he's the ambassador. And then, oh, by the way, Ivanka has a new deal with a Ukrainian oil company that's paying her $80,000 a month. I mean, just there's so many different scenarios you could have in which it's obvious that we would look at that and say, 
if it's totally innocent, I'd sure like to hear all the details because it's almost impossible that it is anything but someone being paid off. Maybe Biden didn't do anything for him. But I think it's obvious that the money that went to Hunter, I'm talking about Joe Biden, maybe the vice president did nothing for him. But I'm telling you, I think the money they paid to Hunter Biden was paid so that they would have influence with the vice president of the United States. And of course, it's come out that the Obama administration was aware of it, and it appears was very, very concerned that this is ugly. So I think it's ugly. And I have, um, you know, and I've always thought it was ugly. And so this New York Post story coming out, I'm, you know, it's not like it's telling me a whole bunch of earth shattering things. I think from first blush, this looked like a corrupt deal. Uh, this looked like someone who was making money trading on his dad's powerful position in our government. And I don't like that. And I don't know who does. And I kind of wonder why there's been so little coverage of it, so little condemnation of it, except that our media is in the tank for one party or the other. And so we only get to hear what they want to tell us. And increasingly, they don't want to tell us very much. Let me do one thing before uh, before we close, Tim. Okay. I saw you about to say something. I had to cut you off quick. You're talking way too much. <laughs> no, uh, did you have something to say on that? Because I have one last point I wanted to make that I thought would be a it'd be a good thing to go home on. Um, one of the reasons this story came up with Mark Cuban uh, about China and him saying, "Oh, let's let's do business. Who cares about totalitarianism?" is that the finals, the NBA playoffs just finished. And I'm a big sports fan. I've become increasingly not a fan of the NBA. I don't watch the NBA anymore. And I was never a big fan. I usually would only watch during the playoffs, but they didn't start playing defense until the playoffs. And I love defense and basketball. And so I used to really enjoy watching the NBA playoffs. I pretty much stopped doing it because of the China stuff. Uh, even before that, they had some gun control ads to say, I'm not interested in, in getting my politics from the NBA. Um, I wish they could they could you know stop people from taking four or five steps and not calling it walking. I mean, just give me a decent basketball game. I'll be happy. I don't need my politics from the NBA. But especially now, putting Black Lives Matter on, on every court um, and and frankly, you know, Black Lives Matter, yes. All Lives Matter, yes. But Black Lives Matter has become a real thing. And the people behind it are Marxists. And I'm not a Marxist. I don't like hundreds of millions of people being denied freedom, starved to death, killed in gulags. I'm just not into that. And, and so I'm not very hip with the whole Black Lives Matter thing. I want cops to have cameras on them. I want all kinds of criminal justice reform. I think we got a serious problem with racism in police departments. But you know what? I think we got a serious problem with police being able to do almost anything they want to anybody. And if you're out there and you're a white person and you think, and, and I just hate to say white person, black person, because you're not that. You're you. But whatever color you are, if you think the police are going to have too much power but not use it against you, just use it against somebody of some other shade, you are whistling past the graveyard. And so we got a serious police problem, but it's, it's, it's not all race related. It's related to power. And we need to fix all these problems. Black Lives Matter is fixing zero of them and it's making new problems and worse ones. But the interesting thing and the reason that this Cuban interview was so in the news and so interesting to me is I bumped into different people, friends of mine or acquaintances, and the subject has come up about sports. And I find that they also are not watching the NBA. And in fact, have, have had other sports where they do this or they do that. You know, college football so far, I haven't seen a lot. But I mean, if I see too much political stuff, and even if it's something I agree with, I've had enough. I do not want any of my sports to decide they want to be my political you know, advisor or something. So um, 
I'm, I've had it. And what happened is there was a little dip in viewership for the NBA finals. Now you have to think that we're in a pandemic. There's not a whole lot of stuff to do. It's not like everyone's going out and having wild parties and stuff. And so you would think that something on television, the finals, and of course this is the LA Lakers are in mm -hmm. it, the Heat, Miami, uh, you know, LeBron James, the, the biggest star is in it. And they had a drop in viewership, nearly 60% fewer viewers on television than a year ago. Now, you could have all kinds of different causes that is a nightmare. And if and if you're listening to this and you haven't heard that the NBA basically just imploded just recently, why haven't you heard it? Have you ever heard of a, a what if the World Series only half as many people, less than half as many people watched it as watched it a year ago? That's not good. Businesses that only have half as many cu customers as they had a year ago, that's not good. This is a serious thing, and it shows that the public is paying attention. As Megyn Kelly noted, your audience is fleeing. And uh, I don't know, a lot of people voting with their, their uh, TV remote. Let's see uh, over these next few weeks how many people vote going to the voting booth or mailing in a ballot. <laughs> and, uh, and let's see what happens. But uh, but I know that so far the voting that involves the NBA says maybe you're a little too close to China and maybe you're a little bit too much sucking up to whatever political wind you think is blowing. And partly because let's say anybody sophisticated knows these people believe in nothing. This is all marketing. If if they endorse your cause, you better double check your cause. Thank you for stopping in to This Week in Common Sense, starring Paul Jacob. My name is Timothy Verkula. You can find me at locofoco.net and at workman.com and under the moniker at workman on social media. That's workman with an I, not an O. Paul writes his columns five days a week at thisiscommonsense.org. You can find this podcast, of course, on YouTube and on SoundCloud and through various podcatchers. Paul will be back next weekend with another podcast, and on Monday he will be at thisiscommonsense.org with more commentary from a common sense point of view.